Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and today I am in Paso Robles with Jeff Strucklis, the Director of Operations and Wine Growing for Onyx Wines. Jeff, welcome, and thank you for joining us. And tell us about Onyx and where we are. We're sitting in a tractor shed right now, but tell us where this tractor shed is. <laughs> hey, thank you for having me. Uh, super excited to be here. So yeah, we are in the tractor shed, as uh, those of you who have come to uh, Onyx Estate and uh, come and done our vineyard tour have experienced. Uh, we even uh, allow you to buy the t-shirt at the end. Um, <laughs> But so this is the original tractor shed on our 120 acre vineyard here on the west side of Templeton, uh, right in the shotgun of the Templeton Gap as you're feeling with that wind coming through here right now. Yeah, it's like 90 some odd degrees and yet there's a beautiful breeze. Well, and um, that really fits into the site here and why it was chosen. Uh, you know, we're typically a good uh, five to 10 degrees cooler in terms of feels like temperature here than a lot of other parts of Paso Robles. And it really allows us to grow a great breadth of great grapes and get a you know little more hang time a few more days than other sites necessarily do so we actually have uh, 22 different grape varieties growing on this estate right now so really just uh, an incredible range in what we're able to accomplish on here and it really uh, lends its style to the type of wine blends that we've been creating since our uh, first vintage back in 2010 through uh you know, we started at maybe 200, 225 cases bottled that first year, and now we're up to doing about five to 6,000 a year. Wow. And how many acres planted do you have here? Um, on this estate, we have uh, 72 planted. Um, maybe the last 12 of those are just started to hit production this year. But, you know, first year production on vines is only a half a ton per acre or so. So <laughs> make of that what you will. I'd say about uh, 60 in full production. And then at our second estate, uh, Kyler Canyon Vineyard, that uh, we just finished replanting the other year, will, um, all said and done, be about 24 more planted acres on uh, 60. Wow. And are you 100% estate fruit? Uh, the only non-estate that uh, we consistently like to uh, play around with is we buy a little bit of Bien Nacido Syrah which uh, it's always just this great uh, cool climate juxtaposition to the warm climate uh, Syrah that we grow on the property here. So a little uh, bit of the old fire and ice, as our owner likes to say. I like that. And where can people find your wines? What markets are they available in? Uh, so primarily we specialize in direct to consumer, but um, we are available through uh, distribution. It's uh, Epic Wines within California. So they do cover most of the state, although I'd say their biggest market is definitely Southern California. Um, and then we're also carried in distribution through partners in uh, Florida. Uh, we're currently just starting up partnerships with Georgia, uh, Maryland, Washington State. Um, gosh, where else are we carried right now? Michigan, we have a distribution in as well as Las Vegas. Wow. That's and Canada. Sorry. And Canada. Parts of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> International. I love it. So, um, what was your first memory relevant to wine? Like, what, what's your first memory? How old were you and what do you remember? Um, so, as far as the two points in my life where I think wine became a lot more relevant, uh, you know, right at the end of my freshman year of college, and this is at a engineering school out in Massachusetts, uh, you know, a buddy walks into my room on that second to last day of class and says something to the effect of, so who wants to go live on the beach in Cape Cod for the summer and just find jobs there? And I was like, all right, I'm in. So <laughs> ended up working at a super high-end hotel out there called the Chatham Bars Inn. Uh, I mean, James Taylor stays there every year. And uh, I worked a wedding uh, for Brian Leach, who was then the captain of the New York Rangers uh, that summer. So, you know, lots of uh, high-end clientele. And uh, I very quickly realized room service is just a horrible, horrible gig. Not even because of the customer service reasons, uh -huh. mainly because you have to work split shifts because it's busy for breakfast and dinner. 
So uh, that didn't really work for me. So I convinced the bar manager he needed a uh, bar back to split between all the uh, restaurants on the property. So that turned into a noon to 8 p.m. shift six days a week that allowed me to go uh, enjoy the nightlife and sleep in uh, on the beach in the mornings. So uh, through that, I actually started seeing, you know, just the both breadth of what the wine world offers and really started asking questions. Well, wait a minute. Like, what is the difference between this? $12 $12 bottle, bottle of uh, Sutter White Zinfandel and this, you know, $250 <laughs> Mouton Rothschild. Like, <laughs> what's going on here? To imagine the two of them side by side. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what a blind tasting it would be, mostly because blind tastings are the most humbling thing in the world, and half the time people would still uh, be shocked which one they prefer. Right. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, um, you know, from there, just working in restaurants through college, I sort of realized, well, one, on a fiscal level, like a good waiter can double or triple his income if he knows how to sell wine. Mm-hmm. But then as I started approaching the world of legality and started tasting more things and eventually even took a couple trips out to California and Napa, I realized, one, I definitely have acquired a taste for uh, the wine world in general. And two, I think, um, you know, I was doing a lot of work in chemical engineering at the time, really focusing on chemistry and biochemistry. And I realized, oh, there's a lot of points of process control and a lot of science going on behind the scenes in wine. So from there, I sort of branched out into the viticulture as well. But uh, I think that's where I really embraced it as a potential uh, career choice. Hmm. So is there a particular wine that you remember tasting um, that was one of those aha moments, whether it was an aha moment about, about a grape, about wine in general, about anything? Do you, do you remember one of those occasions? And what wine was it, if you can remember? Um, you know, I think if I'm being honest and trying to go way back to the beginning, like it's always funny because, you know, when you think of now, we're, we in California here have just the most ridiculous, ridiculous amount of selection as far as what we buy you name it it's at the local supermarket much less just like available to you but on the east coast it was really a focus on which wineries distribute out to where we are Mm -hmm. so if i look back to some of those early great wines we had um you know i I think one of the first ones i truly remember uh really enjoying and seeing what uh north coast cabernet could do um as an example it was uh, from Deloche, actually, which I find hilarious because they're known as a Pinot Noir yeah. winery on the Sonoma <laughs> side. But they have their uh, OFS line, which, um, you know, officially, as far as the COLA, uh, is an acronym for our finest selection. But if you ask uh, the employees there, it stands for uh, out bleeping standing. Um, but uh, it was actually a <laughs> Cabernet that they uh, made that was one of those first ones I remember drinking with friends and being like, man, this is really good. Um, so I think that combined with I look back to, uh, um, you know, just some of the Fumé Blancs that hit regular restaurant uh, distribution uh, in Massachusetts and Connecticut, you know, kind of mild stomping grounds and realizing, oh man, uh, you know, here's some really great stuff that's super versatile, it pairs with just about anything. But, you know, when you think of the New England restaurant market and how seafood focused it is, I mean, uh, those Sauvignon Blancs, those Fumés were just like something you would go through three cases of a night at a restaurant. Wow. So um, I know you you just mentioned the diversity that we have here in California, and I don't know if you've traveled abroad a lot or traveled to other you know, states a lot, but who do you think among all populations drinks the best in terms of quality? <laughs> um, I, I think this is kind of a gauged answer, I suppose. It will either make sense or not make anyone happy. <laughs> the people who drink the best are, I think in many cases, the ones who drink the most local. Because if you look at Europe, um, you know, you always hear people talk about how great their local co-op wine is. Mm-hmm. And these are the wines that never get distributed anywhere. Like the cheap wines that get distributed from any region tend to be the stuff that's just kind of thrown together that no one locally wants to drink. And then the expensive <laughs> stuff is where they know they're making all of their margin. Now, of course, these are generalized rules. But um, I, I think... Uh, You know, as far as importing from other markets, like as long as you're, you know, drinking in a, uh, you know, greater than 
$20 a bottle price point, you typically tend to have a just wealth of awesome options. But say like when I was living in Australia, the only options really were, um, unless you went to the big city, like into Adelaide or Sydney or Melbourne or something, uh, your only options were local wines. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a lot of parts of uh, Europe, it's going to be like that as well, unless you're again going into the more metropolitan areas that uh, do a lot of importation. Right. And so I it's... think the concept of buying stuff from all over is, uh, I think, for the better, but a very American concept. <laughs> and, you know, we're spoiled just through the ridiculous choice that we have. I mean, um, you know, shoot, I've talked to, like, wine buyers I know at big shops into, like, importing Tasmanian Syrah just because I wanted to revisit some stuff from when I lived there. But Well, you're talking about, you know all the options. So I'm wondering if I were to walk into your wine cellar right now, and again, I'm not asking how large it is or where exactly it is, but your personal wine cellar, would I find a big international mix of wines or what would I find in there? Um, I think you'd find about two thirds uh, local California, um, mm -hmm. primarily central coast driven because I've drinking down a lot of my stuff from my uh, years that I did live in the North coast. Um, I would say about one third uh, foreign with a, focus on the aging side of probably uh, dry German Rieslings and Northern Rhone uh, Syrah based wines. So I think, you know, a lot of my foreign purchasing is driven by early on. It was when I traveled internationally and would bring things in a suitcase back with me, <laughs> which, you know, always comes with the best stories, but it's a really terrible way to get wine somewhere. And then it focused on when I would do uh, wholesale, like sales trips and stuff, working the market, like mm -hmm. cool stuff I found in stores. And now it's more like, oh, I'm looking for some of this. Let me look up the distributor and I'll find one or two other people to order with me and we'll order a couple cases of stuff and split it. Yeah. I always find, you know, in Paso, because Roan Varieties play such a, a prominent role in what you grow here that, mm -hmm. of course, you know, there's a... A true love for those Rhone wines. Um, you mentioned that you do 22 different grapes here. Are they uh, predominantly Rhone varieties? Oh, no. Um, full mix, because uh, I'll be the first to say a big part of the heart of uh, Onyx Estate here and Onyx Wines blending style um, lies in the fact that, you know, we feel the Rhone blending rules were amazing and perfect for the Rhone Valley. And um, I think there's a lot of similarities between, you know, there and here, which is why, uh, you know, I, we do have uh, a lot of Syrah, Grenache, Mouved, arguably there are probably three of the five uh, highest volume planted uh, items that we have. Mm -hmm. And we do have a little bit of some more obscure ones, uh, Grenache Blanc, Picpoul Blanc. Uh, we even have a little bit of Vacarese now, which is oh. going to be super fun. But um, I think in truth, you know, I've always said, and I started saying this five years ago, so I should really say, I hope another five or 10 years down the line, when someone says, oh, I'm drinking a uh, blend from Paso Robles, people will automatically think, oh, well, that's kind of uh, could be a, you know, Rhone Bordeaux sort of hybrid, like uh, mixing not just Grenache, Syrah and Mouved, but I would say, uh, you know, Cab and Zinfandel or some of the other uh, wines and grapes that just grow super well in this area and are something that absolutely have a home in the blends for here because I think if we're defining anything it should be rules for this region and not right. necessarily uh, just rotely copying what somewhere half the world away does. Is there something uh, from your cellar or uh, out and about that you opened recently that drank really well? Um, you know, I think one thing I've had a lot of fun with over the last year or two, and this actually I think relates to uh, Paso as well, are the still wines of the Douro Valley in Portugal. Mm. You know, I think as we uh, work through the effects of climate change, we're all realizing that uh, California, you know, certain microclimates aside are just going to keep getting warmer and warmer. And I do think uh, the Douro Valley ha has a lot of good uh, analogous uh, comparisons to be made uh, climactically to Paso. So that's actually part of the reason we've done a little bit of planting of uh, Turiga Nacional and Cezao here wow. as well. So uh, 
If you ever uh, stumble across a varietal uh, Tariga Nacional from uh, Tinto de Crosto, um, I highly recommend it. Or sorry, Quinto de Crosto. Mm-hmm. And is that what you drank recently? It is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> they also do a great uh, old vine, which is a blend of uh, Turiga, Suzao, and um, Tinta Horish, which uh, for those of you who don't know, Tinta Horish is the Tempranillo. Portuguese word for Tempranillo, which uh, <laughs> we work with quite a bit here. So you're working with a lot of different varieties. You're in the vineyard. Um, I'm curious, do you think there's a such thing as a perfect variety? <laughs> well, um, loaded question, but uh, I guess for me, um, my love for the last really seven or eight years has probably been Syrah. And I think Syrah might as well be a different variety for every climate that it's grown in. It changes um, for me so much between, you know, coastal California, inland California, Washington State, uh, mainland Australia, island Australia, northern Rhone, just everywhere it grows, it's something different. So for me, it's the perfect grape because it's so uh, representative of, you know, its home and also because it's not the same every time. Mm. So perfect in its um, um, diversity. (laughs) Yeah, that that sounds better than anything I could come up with. (laughs) So as a wine drinker, some quick ones. Red, white, or rosé? White lately. Still or sparkling? (sighs) Sparkling does go with all occasions, but actually I uh, lean much more heavily into still. And if, okay, so you lean to still, but if you do sparkling, champagne or from somewhere else? whatever's available. (laughs) Um, I have had a ton of fun with sparklings from uh, the non-recognized regions lately. I mean, uh, New Zealand sparkling, uh, sparkling Norello Mescalese from, you know, the islands south of uh, Italy. Like, there's so much great stuff out there. I think it's uh, never time to get uh, caught in a one-dimensional trap. So speaking of one-dimensional traps, okay, you mentioned before being introduced to Sauvignon Blancs and Fumé Blancs and seeing how beautifully they paired with the cuisine that is on the East Coast. In in Connecticut, a lot of lobster, lobster rolls, and fresh seafood. Um, I don't know if that helped you with how you pair food and wine, but what is your approach to pairing food and wine? Do you think there are rules that need to be followed? Are there certain things you look for? Or do you just sort of take a, ha, the bottle's open. (laughs) <laughs> That's what I'm drinking. <laughs> um, you know, I think that really is always going to come down to the level of comfort of the person uh, partaking. If I were to find a good general kind of mid-tier level, I like to pair acidity. Like, you know, if you're having a rich, heavy, more buttery food, like going with something that's really overly acidic is going to seem kind of awkward and stands out in comparison. Uh, If you're having something that is, you know, sharper, like, you know, if you did ceviche with a really flat, heavy, but delicious cab, that might be a little weird. So, um, you know, I'd say acidity is a good target to go for, but the one, you know, truthism I'll stand behind because, you know, I I think we as an industry do a horrible job of intimidating the heck out of our customers and making them all feel like a bunch of jerks for even trying. So I like to keep it simple and I just tell someone, if you're ever in doubt, if you know you like a wine and you like a food, you're probably going to enjoy them together. Like, you know, if you really love In-N-Out burgers and you love that, uh, you know, buttery Chardonnay, then match that up for sure. (laughs) Like, you know, you never want to be disappointed. And I think you never want to force people to think too much about it or else Mm -hmm. they're just going to get in their heads. Hmm. So for somebody who hasn't had the pleasure to taste Onyx wines yet, what do you think they're missing out on? Uh, Well, I think uh, our specialty within a region like Paso, which is so known for kind of this unyielding, aggressive power structure, is uh, this particular site that we're um, sitting on and just feeling that wind that blows through here. It does bring a little bit more delicateness to the property. Delicacy? Whichever version of the word works. Elegance. Uh, (laughs) uh... (laughs) Uh, So I do feel we have a lot of uh, layers of just... uh, beautiful fruit and different uh, spice notes that come off of our wines and we're able to make these really complete wines that have structure without being monolithic and overbearing. So, um, you know, I think we're just trying to bring some extra layers of uh, subtlety and elegance to a region that, you know, 
already has uh, its own leaning and just trying to do something a little bit differently from some of our neighbors. Ooh. So if space aliens were to land on your property right now, which of your wines would you want to welcome them with? Uh, I mean, I think you always have to welcome people with uh, the white to start out with. So, uh, you know, field Wet day. Their palate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you, you got to leave them wanting more. Like uh, if, if you start out with the biggest wine, there's nowhere to go from there. <laughs> so you mentioned field day. What, mm -hmm. Tell me about that wine. Uh, field day is a blend of the original three whites that we grow on the property here. So always uh, Sauvignon Blanc lead, but mm -hmm. with a nice little shot of uh, Viognier for depth and uh, Grenache Blanc for acidity backbone Ooh, a very aromatic wine absolutely so you're a viticulturalist you're in the vineyard and managing all of that um walking through the vineyard do you tend to talk to your vines do you speak to them <laughs> and if so what do you say um, you know, I don't talk to them individually just because I feel like I'd only be talking to such a small percentage of them that, uh, you know, I, I'd feel like I, were, I was leaving others out. But I would say uh, going through the vineyard by definition has to be a very physical experience. I mean, you really have to uh, dig up in that soil with your hands. You can't just grab like the leaf or the cluster that's out the most, like mm -hmm. especially in some of these deeper canopies we have, like the uh, modified lyre system. We're growing like say the Sauvignon Blanc that's right outside the wall there mm -hmm. or the Malbec on. You have to like get your head and shoulders like inside the vines and really uh, see what it's like inside the canopy so you can see if you're getting the right kind of light covering through. So if you're not leaving the vineyard kind of dirty, you've probably uh, slacked a little bit on uh, what you should have been doing out there. So you're not talking to them, but you're getting intimate. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They, they know I was there for better or worse. Uh, there's no hiding it. <laughs> So every vintage tells a different story. I mean, we're in California where we're blessed to have relative consistency. Do you find that um, there's more variation from year to year or more similarity? Um, I, there's always more variation, but part of that is, you know, probably human psychology as well. Um, you know, if you give someone five different wines, they're going to tell you the differences between them. If you blindly serve them five of the exact same wines, they're going to tell you the perceived difference between them. Mm. So I think as humans from the point of birth, we're trained to differentiate things. So even if I had two identical vintages in a row, I'd be telling you about this one different leaf hopper I saw or uh, that two degree uh, extra temperature swing on this one day. But, you know, in truth, when you're living it, walking it, you always, I think, just remember um, what seemed unusual, what seemed different, or quite frankly, what really cool thing sort of happened. So that's always what's going to resonate, I think, in your memory. Um, are there any signs or omens that you look for that you that will help you determine what a harvest is going to be or a vintage is going to be? Uh, my favorite one, uh, anecdotally, and for me, it only works when I see it, not when someone else I know reports having seen it. When I see my first uh, tarantula of the fall, that's when I expect the first uh, rain to be coming. Huh. And if you don't see a tarantula, but someone claims they did? Uh, well, maybe they'll see rain, but it's not going to hit the properties I'm watching over, hopefully, is uh, the way I go with it. Ah, interesting. And do you have any rituals or traditions that you individually or as a team do at the start of harvest? Uh, the start, not really. I mean, it's as simple as maybe first box in, uh, you know, busting out some uh, bubbly to uh, spray over the grapes or something. But I'd say uh, on the opposite side, the favorite end of harvest tradition, and probably especially because I come through the background of production and working in the winery um, on that side of things, uh, myself and uh, Drew, our head winemaker now, um, have always, uh, since we opened the new facility, played nothing but the uh, best of queen on the radio for the uh, last day of grape processing. I so, love uh, it. And it doesn't officially <laughs> count until all like the obscure songs start playing. So all the movie soundtracks like Flash. <laughs> yeah, until you get the uh, Flash Show Gordon theme on. and the, uh, you know, I want to ride my bicycle song. Like, Yep. My favorite band. My favorite. 
<laughs> uh, they're my biggest regret for, uh, obviously, they passed out of circulation before I could ever see them live. I but, fully agree. One of my greatest regrets. You know, I think seeing, <laughs> like, the uh, Queen play at Wembley or something like that would be one of those, like, worth spending your chance to go back in time uh, mm-hmm. opportunities on. Yeah. For whatever Bohemian Rhapsody as a movie was, which I have, I enjoyed the music and was entertained for two hours because it was Queen music, but I have a lot of complaints about it as a movie. Um, when when he recreated the Wembley Stadium and stood there and in the movie theater, the noise, I felt that was like the closest I would ever get to actually watching Freddie Mercury live. Oh, yeah. No, I think uh, <laughs> uh, Unreal uh, to even I get ch- maybe it's just the wind or maybe I actually just got chills. I don't know. <laughs> thinking about actually going back in time and trying to experience that. So. <laughs> um, do you ever play music to your wine? You know, I went through uh, some early experiments with this in my first uh, internship, actually, at Maryvale up in Napa, because there was a uh, consultant uh, working with us that year who said you had to play uh, classical music for uh, the tanks of wine. And uh, (laughs) me and the other intern who got put in charge of the late night shifts were just like, nah, that ain't happening. And it uh, turned into a lot more like, um, you know, Tool and Primus and Depeche Mode and other really and then, <laughs> random uh, <laughs> rock to hard rock sort of stuff. And then the next day he'd come to work and say, my wine seems really agitated and I'm upset. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> well, it was 2010, so it worked nicely. I mean, that year had a lot of uh, concentration and uh, depth. Luckily, uh, that didn't coincide with the uh, terrible 2011 vintage uh, up there where... Uh, well, say, I uh, suppose I would have uh, started seeing tarantulas uh, in like March if uh, 2010 <laughs> followed my uh, <laughs> history of uh, traditions. But So when you were a little boy, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, my first answer, and my parents will absolutely verify this, uh, I wanted to be a garbage man so I could ride on the back of the truck. <laughs> and then you became an engineer. <laughs> uh, it went from like garbage man to being a doctor to actually looking at like the eight years plus of schooling required to be a doctor. And then I said, well, I'm, I, I became an engineer for the wrong reasons, even though it was the perfect career choice for me. Mm-hmm. I was as a kid, I was logical enough to be like, I'm good at math and science. Therefore, I should be a chemical engineer because it has a good starting salary. <laughs> <laughs> and that just like trained me to go into more or less any field, because what you don't realize until probably two years after you graduate with a chemical engineering degree is that they didn't train you to do anything. They like trained you in a methodology of problem solving that allows you to work in a ton of different fields, but like, it's kind of universally applicable. So you're like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm applying everything I learned. And yet technically don't feel like I'm applying anything. I learned. And you applied it to the chemistry of wine. So well, I like to go. say um, <laughs> between my biopharma career and between winemaking, both of my career choices have just been glorified plumbing. <laughs> So when you're not working as a plumber, how do you spend your free time? (laughs) Uh, You know, the older I get, the less and less of that I have. But uh, no, I mean, I always, uh, as a rule, try to have an interest in at least one uh, strange sport. It started out with uh, rugby, went into Brazilian jiu-jitsu and uh, has mainstreamed a little more as I've aged and I got into the uh, cult of CrossFit and then uh, lately I finally decided uh, my age is catching up with me so I needed to start playing golf um, you know, <laughs> spend a, uh, a lot of time with uh, my girlfriend Caitlin and her family um, certainly exploring trying other wines um, watching uh, bad horror movies uh, definitely my favorite film <laughs> genre I think horror is the new comedy or probably has been for a decade now. Um, do you have a favorite sports team or athlete in particular? Oh, I'm a, uh, not a popular choice out here, but a good one for across the U.S. anyways. I'm very much a uh, Red Sox and Patriots Boston guy. Mm-hmm. I grew up... Uh, Should have known that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I grew up north of what we call the Munson-Nixon line in Connecticut. Um, named after Trot Nixon and Thurman Munson. So it's kind of the imaginary divider between uh, Red Sox and Yankees fans. Um, So um, if the Red Sox were to win, if they had one this year, (laughs) because I know... Oh, they're atrocious. (laughs) (laughs) 
If they were to win a championship, which of your wines would you want to present to the team? <laughs> um, oh, I think definitely uh, for either uh, Sox or Patriots, um, I would always be uh, all about providing uh, reckoning our Syrah-based blend here. I think it's our uh, biggest, chewiest wine and definitely uh, something that you can both um, you know, celebrate a serious victory with while also, and I think more importantly in a celebratory sense, it's one of those wines, you know, you can identify purely by the stain it leaves on a white tablecloth. So if you're going to spray it around, I mean, you might as well make a mess worth cleaning up in celebration. Absolutely. So if you're planning a romantic evening for you and your girlfriend, what sort of wines would you uh, open up for to set the mood? Uh, I mean, two ways you can go. I mean, if I'm going with a bigger wine, which is kind of less her personal style, it's more just because it's something that's like kind of a, you know, big deal that I wanted to uh, show off or know that we've been sitting on. Uh, Caitlin's definitely very much a Pinot kind of girl. So, you know, especially at the start of a meal, that's a good place to start. Or I think she uh, subconsciously knows it's always a good evening if I start out with like a five to ten year old uh, dry German Grosse Gewachs Riesling as well. Mm, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when you look back at your career or uh, life, is there a piece of advice that, you know, kind of carries you through? Is there something you try to live by? And if so, well, who gave you that piece of advice? <laughs> Um, you know, there's lots of bits and pieces out there, and I think I've gotten lots of very similar advice in hindsight that were spoken in very different ways that I didn't realize until like later on. But, um, you know, one great piece of advice I actually got from the owner of Onyx is that, you know, early on, it's the most important thing for everyone, I think, is really acquiring different sets of experiences because all of that is going to form into what you're able to do in you know your more prove yourself sort of years mm -hmm. like uh so you know during your 20s when you get out of school or you know if you even bother you know going that route like either way just try and do lots of different types of jobs so you really just have a good holistic picture of what's out there um i was super fortunate that even coming into this career later in life uh working through onyx it was kind of a one or two man shop for the first uh three four years so i was doing both uh wholesale market work direct to consumer hospitality and winemaking all at the same time <laughs> so while it was a stressful job and not what everyone else i went to school with thought they wanted like i feel like i have a much more complete picture of the industry now but the other thing I can say from personal experience is I've always sort of felt like when I was eight and the rare moments when I'm able to shut my conscious mind up and really sort of feel what's out there. Um, you know, I, I think the right path is oftentimes the one that is has the least resistance being put in front of you to follow. Um, you know, there was, there was lots of reasons to talk myself into staying in biopharma and, you know, the safe career and um, not moving out to California and taking the, uh, you know, path that I'd kind of been telling people I wanted to follow for a while. But once I finally kind of gave in and started doing it, you know, I filled out a couple prereqs for UC Davis, fired off my application really quickly, and suddenly I came back from a, you know, trip with a bunch of friends and got offered a... Uh, scholarship to cover my out-of-state tuition and then you know i moved out there with the backup plan of well my old boss now is a vp for genentech and he'll hire me right away and then when i finally started talking to him i was like actually you know this wine thing feels like it's going really well i'm not even going to take up that part-time job and you know kind of hurt my chances of really following in wine and but it's keeping know. options open the whole time it's good to have options, and I think that has to do with my poker playing style. I'm a semi-bluffer. Like, I'm willing to bluff, but there have to be outs. Uh, it, you, you can look that up in books. That's a real thing. A semi-bluffer? <laughs> so when you look back at your career, what would you say is one of your proudest achievements to date, uh, uh, other than being a semi-bluffer? <laughs> oh, man. Um, I mean, you have a long career ahead of you. So, I mean, there's obviously a lot of achievements to come. But looking back, <laughs> uh, I think every year has had some incredibly awesome achievements. I mean, um, and it's all like they're dumb little things at the moment that mean a lot later on. Like, you know, 
if I said uh, getting fertigation implemented in the vineyard, like it sounds like a pretty boring, it's actually a very plumbing related thing, <laughs> but like these are the changes, you know, you talk about doing for a year or two and finally make and you realize the difference it can actually make in, you know, plant nutrition and being able to uh, improve the pH and acid balance that your grapes come in at or, um, you know, I think... Uh, just getting the validation of those, uh, you know, first couple good scoring vintages that said, oh, you know, our, we tried to do something a little different and we're being told uh, both through people buying the wine and some of the critics out there that, hey, this is a valid thing. You've, you know, earned your place at the table. But if I had to say, actually, my one uh, proudest achievement which is, you know, dumb because it's our least expensive product as like a winery and it's not the one you like make money on or build your business off of. When I first moved down with Onyx, uh, started 2012, um, we decided that year to make a rosé, not because we were trying to tap into the rosé market, which no one of us or none of us were really acknowledging at the time. It was because we wanted to drink a rosé. <laughs> and we started saying, well, you know, What's a different, what would an, an Onyx Rosé grape be instead of just making a Grenache one like uh, most of the rest of Paso? And we settled on Tempranillo because, you know, one, we have a decent chunk planted, but two, it's a very integral part to a lot of the blending that we do. And uh, that first year we made, I think we bottled 72 cases, sold out of it pretty quickly. And every year after that, we kept like doubling the quantity we made and selling out twice as fast. Wow. Like until we finally peaked, I want to say around 15 or 1800 cases of it. And that's where we said, all right, we're, we're going to level off here. Like, you know, you, you don't want to grow beyond the uh, capacity of what you can actually grow fruit wise yourself or else yeah. then you're introducing a lot more variables. But, but you were uh, like on the, you were <laughs> on the early part of the curve of rosé and grew exponentially. Well, we did it for the right reasons. We wanted to drink it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you had mentioned uh, getting some good scores. Um, what's your opinion of wine critics and scores? Um, you know, I think it's like anything else. Uh, it establishes validity for, you know, some customers. It gives potential customers peace of mind and knowing that you're not a fly by night, uh, you know, manufacturing operation that's going to buy bulk and, uh, you know, pump it full of oak alternatives and, <laughs> you know, make whatever type of uh, product out there, you know, in the same way, I'd say, yeah, I, I don't personally advocate, you know, only buying things that get, you know, 97 or higher from a certain critic, unless you know that critic really and truly matches your personal flavor palette. You know, there are critics who will give um, some wines that I love, like uh, scores in, you know, the mid 80s and uh, other ones who will give wines that I dislike, like, you know, 98s. And, and I think uh, the best way I can explain it on a scientific level is like, um, you know, when you were in high school or uh, freshman year college courses and you to have a bunch of like uh, scattered data and you have to make that reg regression line that tells you was this a good correlation or not and you get that value for R squared and you know you're always like wanting a 0.99 or a 0.98 that says it's as close to one as possible in sensory science a good R squared is like 0.4 <laughs> so that tells you the ridiculous scatter of humans being able to taste things so uh Looking for true correlation um, in uh, the sensory world is, uh, I think, a fool's errand. And I think the more we all learn to trust our own palates, that's probably the better way to go. Well, I mean, I think that would be great advice. If you were to give our listeners advice, is that what you would tell them to do? Or is there something else you would add to that? Um, well, I'm going to give it from, I guess, the ground up. So say you have a listener who's just getting into wine, has only had, you know, a dozen bottles of their in their life. Um, the best place to start is to pick um, one bottle out of those 12 that you know you really enjoyed. And wherever you buy your wine, you know, find uh, one of the employees who looks like they know what they're doing over there. Or if you have a friend that you talk to about wine, whatever, just say, I like this one and give them one reason that you or one thing that you liked about that wine. Maybe you liked it because it was really fruity. Maybe you liked it because it was just really big and structured. Uh, maybe you liked it because it smelled a little bit like wet saddle leather. You know, some people like Britannomyces. Like, that's a thing. <laughs> 
total respect. But if you can tell me one reason you like to wine, that helps me infinitely with trying to give you three, four, ten more wines that you're going to like. Mm-hmm. So learning to do it that way, iteratively, just naming that one thing you liked, saying, hey, can you recommend something else that's like that, I think is the best way to go. As you get more comfortable and know the things you like, then you can start looking at, you know, some uh, critics' publications because, you know, it is great. Like, each one of those things, guides comes out and they rated like a thousand wines in it. So you can look for certain keywords in there or if you just want to go for certain point scores. I mean, either way, it helps you narrow it down. But it's an intimidating world, you know? You got 10 million wines out there and you got to narrow it down to one of the ones right in front of you that you're going to put on your table. Complete the sentence for me. A table without wine is like... A dinner without spice? Okay. So imagine a scenario, a dinner table in a restaurant, your wines are sitting on the table, and people are enjoying it, and there are paparazzi at the window very excited about who's drinking your wine. If you could pick any person, living or deceased, that you'd want drinking your wines, who would that be? Oh, well, I've got two different ways I'm going to answer this. Okay. Uh, one is on just more of like a uh, personal hero sort of level. So uh, one, I could say if I could somehow uh, alter time and space to uh, walk up on uh, Nikola Tesla and Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, debating uh, the chemistry of one of my wines, I think that would be uh, pretty epic. <laughs> I think that would be pretty epic, too. Um So I want you to tell me now, we're getting towards the end, three wines that you would take with you to a deserted island. What three wines would you want to be drinking if they were your last three wines? Uh, Well, for sure, there's going to be a, uh, you know, Donoff, Grosse Givox, like uh, Ermenzola or uh, (laughs) Naderhauser, um, you know, one of their single vineyard uh, GG dry Mm -hmm. Rieslings there from uh, Ryan Hessen, because that's Mm. that's just my jam. There's uh, no way in avoiding that. (laughs) I I could honestly make that all three. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) But um, to keep it more interesting and give you a little bit of range here, I will... uh, Also say we definitely need to get some uh, good uh, Northern Rhone in there. So I'm thinking like, uh, you know, it'd be fun to say like Hermitage, but in truth, I've never drank a lot of it because it's been out of my price range Mm -hmm. uh, for so long. So I'm going to go with uh, one of my favorite St. Joseph uh, producers here. The, I'd, I'd call it the poor man's Hermitage, but in the last five years, uh, that's uh, gotten a lot pricier <laughs> than it used to be as well. But um, I would say probably like a Pierre Ganon uh, St. Joseph with a little bit of age. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Shavs I like a lot younger, but they do get a little uh, funky with too many years on there. And then uh, the other, oh man, um, you know, Cab Franc has always been... Uh, one of my uh, favorite varieties for, uh, well, I'd say versatility, depending how you make it. Mm-hmm. But actually, I've been having a uh, huge amount of fun with I, more youthful, expressive, or expressive versions from, I'd say, the more um, delicate uh, regions of uh, the Loire Valley. So I'd say just like a, maybe a Olga, Rafault, Chanon, or else even some of like the uh, Burgoys or Saint Nicolas de Burgoys out there that I think embrace less on the uh, oak and funk and put a lot more just uh, expression on the fruit that Cab Franc can throw at you. Well, we play a little game at Wine Soundtrack where we pair wine and music. We're at that point now. I'm wanting to see if you pull out music as quickly as you pulled out some of those producer names. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, you, we've talked about a couple different wines throughout this. So I just want you to tell me, I'll pick the wine that you talked about and you tell me what kind of music it either inspires you to listen to or makes you think of. So I want to start with your white wine that you spoke about field day. Oh man, field day. Um, well, I feel like, uh, 
that for me, maybe it's just uh, the energy that that wine has, but I always get kind of like that uh, high tone character that reminds me of like the uh, violin uh, orchestral intro to uh, Bittersweet Symphony by the Verve. Ooh. But I also think the word Verve is a great uh, expression for how I think uh, Drew and the team really try to uh, make our white wines and just making sure they have that uh, tension in there and that energy to really carry it across your palate. Ooh. So speaking about tension and white wine, what about your um, Riesling, your Gigi Riesling? <laughs> oh, oh. oh, man, that's got to be something from like uh, the denouement of some like epic movie or something. So uh, actually, no, I, I knew it when I said denouement. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and this uh, is a gentleman that actually uh, passed in the last year as well. So uh, all due respect to uh, Enrico Morioni. But uh, I don't know if you're familiar with his composition, The Ecstasy of Gold which is both um, something I first became familiar with because it's how Metallica has opened to every one of their concerts for like the last 20 years. Also something they did a co-creation with uh, the San Francisco Philharmonic on. But it was originally uh, the scene or the musical score for the uh, final graveyard scene at the end of, uh, was it The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly? One of the old uh, spaghetti westerns. Ooh. Okay, uh, what about um, your reckoning that you had mentioned that you would be giving your sports teams if they won? Your Syrah, Petite Syrah, Grenache, Zinfandel, Tempranillo blend. Well, um, I mean, this is easy because it literally, its name comes from a story about music anyways, although I don't know that this is the song I would play celebratorily for a sports team. (laughs) But uh, when we made the original Reckoning and we're trying to name it, there's just this little touch of smoke and um, just kind of brimstone on there that made me think of the whole uh, legend. Do you know who uh, Robert Johnson was? Mm -hmm. Uh, the Crossroad Delta Blues Man, so uh, Mississippi Delta Blues. Um, he was a guy who basically had been, you know, a no name, forgettable musician for, you know, his early life. And then suddenly he left town, comes back a year later, and out of nowhere, he's uh, shredding like no one ever has, has a incredibly short career where he's super, you know, famous and then mysteriously dies. And he basically started the whole legend of, uh, you know, the uh, blues man going to the crossroads at, uh, you know, sunset and making a deal with the devil for his uh, fame and fortune. So I'd have to say for Reckoning, it's definitely the uh, Crossroad Blues by Robert Johnson. He was one of the inspirations for Eric Clapton and a lot of other modern musicians. Wow. Okay, one more. You've got, we've got your Mad Crush sitting here, which is also a blend, a Grenache Tempranillo, Moved, Syrah, Zinfandel, and Petit Syrah. So, last one. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Mad Crush is uh, really, it has a lot of grapes in it, but we always really try to show off the uh, Grenache with this. It's that light, more ethereal sort of uh, character on there. So, man, where would I go with that one? Uh, that for me, and uh, it's probably uh, not something the rest of our team would agree with, but uh, for me, it sort of has that um, winding, sort of floating the air spiral of uh, Tool's Lateralis, where it was actually uh, the lyrics for the song were written on a Fibonacci sequence, <laughs> which is the uh, perfect geometric <laughs> mean that uh, things that grow in a spiral actually grow in in nature. Oh my god, totally geeking out here. (laughs) Jeff, (laughs) thank you for sharing all that interesting music. Very eclectic, very cool, and great explanations with it. Um, Just before we go, I have a question for you. What wine region in the world is next on your bucket list? Ooh, good one. Um, Well... I'd say there's about 12 of them that are currently on my immediate bucket list, but I think as far as uh, places uh, Caitlin and I have been talking about, I'm thinking either uh, Duro Valley of uh, Portugal or else uh, getting out to uh, the Ribeiro de Duero um, in Spain. Ah, both great regions. I've had the pleasure to visit both. Not in depth, but I've been to them. Um, So while you're planning your trips... If people want to plan their trip to Paso Robles, how can they come visit Onyx? 
Uh, well, we try to be super easy to connect with, uh, you know, whether you uh, call us on the phone number online, uh, email us info at onyxwines.com. But actually, the most relevant thing, um, we actually offer a concierge service for anyone, not just our actual uh, club members. So I always encourage people to email either uh, info at onyxwines.com, O-N-X-W-I-N-E-S, uh, or concierge at onyxwines.com. And if you have uh, any interest in visiting one of our locations, I really recommend the Vineyard Tour. Um or if you just want some suggestions as to other wineries to go to, help booking somewhere, suggestions for what restaurants in town you should pre-book or anything, um, we are more than happy to uh, help you out with any and all of that. Ooh, a one-stop shop. So check out Onyx Wines, and not only do you visit this winery, but you can have your whole agenda planned for you. We aim to please. <laughs> well, Jeff, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing everything and joining us on Wine Soundtrack. Hey, thanks for having me. And uh, anytime you or anytime you're uh, looking for someone to come up with a complex reason to justify liking hard rock, uh, holler at me. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.